He is the author of Doing Math with Python. So if you want to check out his book, he has a copy of his book here, if you want to have a look at it. Um, he is also the cre creator and maintainer of Fedora Scientific, a Linux distribution targeted towards computer users in the educational, scientific, and numerical fields. Thank you. Thanks, Goody. Hi, everyone. Um, great to be here. So thank you for the introduction, Katie. So yeah, I am Amit Saha, and thanks to Facebook, I've got this nice map here. So I'm from Sydney, um, here for the education seminar today. Um, um, so I'm the author of the book called Doing Math with Python, um, which is this, like, so the title of the talk and the book are of like same title, which is not a coincidence. Um, so this book was published last year in August, I think same time. So far it has been translated to a few languages. Um, I don't read any of the others, so I have no idea. Um, but anyway, the covers are nice. So, um, so that's the Japanese translation, then the French and the Korean translation. Um, so if you're following along, like uh, you can go to this link, it's bit.ly math with Python, and you will get uh, the slides as well as the demos. Um, so if you go there, you will basically find this. So you can, uh, there's a readme, which uh, you can download the zip archive and uh, install Anaconda Python distribution. Uh, there's a basic guide, which I have linked to, so you may find that useful. Um, so the demos are all here. Um, I should mention that um, all these demos are Jupyter notebooks, but uh, besides a few, uh, like the interactive notebooks, I don't depend, like none of these demos actually require Jupyter notebook to run. I just, it, it's just, well, easier and uh, it's, it's a good way to demonstrate during presentations. So that's why they are just as Jupyter notebooks. And uh, I'll jump ahead a bit just to show a few things. Um, and uh, slides which have associated demos with them would have this thing here, so you can follow along in the specific notebook. Okay, so with all that done, so why math with Python? Um, I think I should give a bit of a background, and uh, it is unlike to a lot of among you who have like um, basic like uh, hands-on day-to-day interaction with students. I don't have that, so whatever I talk today and what I'm proposing today or whatever in my book is draws a lot upon my experiences 20 years back when I was learning to program. Um, so when I learned to program, and I was obviously learning other subjects as well in school, what I felt was there was a quite a bit of disconnect between programming as well as the other subjects that I was learning, as if programming was meant to be like a tool just to learn for its own sake and hopefully someday I'll be able to use it in something. Um, whereas other subjects were like really important and everything else. So what happened was I saw two things. Some students, like, like me, I got interested in the programming part, uh, but a lot of them did, did not understand, like did not really get to programming because obviously they were not taught in a way that they could learn properly. And some of them dropped out. When they were given an option to opt out of the programming subject, they just opted out and opted for the other. Um, but what I feel is if at that stage, if programming was uh, made, like programming was shown in a way that it could solve problems, or not, not necessarily solve problems, maybe explore other subjects, I think it would just make it more interesting for everybody. Um, so to summarize, what I believe is uh, integrating Python with other uh, subjects, uh, math and maybe others, would lead to a more interactive and enriching teaching and learning experience. Um, so how, how do you do that? So the tools that you're going to use is Python 3. Um, so I don't use Python 2, like I don't try to aim for any Python 2 compatibility, just because I want to be like forward looking and somebody learning something new for the first time, they don't need to know what the differences are even. So um, the package which forms an integral part of my proposal is SymPy. Um, I'll get to that uh, in a next two slides. And the third is matplotlib for drawing graphs and uh, um, in essentially animations and anything graphical. Um, those are the links you can follow along. Um, so I should obviously tell just even before I start is how much math, what kind of math am I talking about? Um, so the math I'm talking about is basic algebra, uh, basic statistics, sets, probability, um, random numbers, a uh, bit of probability, um, discrete probability mostly, a bit of continuous, um, but that is an application, so which I'll get later, and some basic calculus. How much Python am I talking about? Um, I'm assuming that the reader or the student would know about defining and calling functions. Um, they would know about loops and basic data structures. 
Um, they would know how to create objects of classes, how to access an attribute of a class, and they would know how to call methods and objects. Um, that's all my assumptions that I'm making when I'm making my proposal um, in the next slides. Um, so let's get started. So Python as a, so I, I have um, sort of um, uh, organized this talk into three different parts. Like first I show Python as a scientific calculator, second as Python as this really awesome calculator, and then I go into where you go beyond calculations, where you explore things which you wouldn't otherwise be able to explore without programming. Um, so first is scientific calculator. Um, I, I assume a lot of us among here, among us here, are familiar with the standard math modules. So, greatest common divisor, uh, pretty simple factorial, or we can do things like validate simple known results, like when you're um, learning or teaching trigonometry, like this sine square theta plus cos square theta equal to one. Um, we could do this, like. Um, so this, I can see, like I have to convert um, the theta into radians because. That's what all the, um, the trigonometric functions assume. And then um, a newly or more recent one is the statistics module, which has the basic statistics function. So you can do like uh, calculate the mean of a data set or the medium of a data set. And then using this, you can use this as a building blocks and develop your own functions, of course. Um, but what becomes more interesting is when you're using, say, the Python startup variable, you can define your own functions. Um, so for example, Um, here I'm using, uh, I don't know how much of it is visible. So this is the, I'm starting the idle editor. Idle 3 is the, the Python 3 version, of course. And I'm just specifying this file, which has some of my functions defined. So when I start the interpreter now, I'm going to have my, so this is a function which I have in that file. It's just a simple, basic uh, unit conversion function. So when I start the Python interpreter, I have all these custom functions ready for me to use. So I can basically say, okay, what do I want to do? So, and similarly, I have, I think I have another function defined, but anyway. Um, so that's the idea, so which is you can use the built-in modules and uh, write your own functions, your custom functions, whatever calculations you may need to do all the time. So the, what it gives us is we don't need to do this import math. We don't need to import the, the module itself. It is already there when you start the interpreter. Okay, so question time. If I were to tell you that you need to write a program which tells you this, enter an expression in X to graph, the user inputs that expression and creates this graph, how many lines would this take? Any guesses? One line? <laughs> Sir? No, using pure Python. You said one, how, how would you do that? Two. <laughs> <laughs> um, would you load up like a map plot there and then have all that and like just the basic uh, name space create? Yeah, that would be one approach, but that would, yeah, that, that would be, yeah, that, that's definitely one approach I would take, which is, yeah, generate these numbers in a certain range and then plot it. That would be one approach. Um, I don't know how many lines that'll take, but I'll show a approach in like in a, in a few minutes, which will basically allow you to, but the problem is, see, the problem with that is your, the function that you're trying to plot, that would be needed in your program. You wouldn't be able to take x square plus x plus one as an input, right? So that's a drawback. Um, I'll show you a program in like a few minutes which is a four lines and it allows you to enter any expression in X and it'll draw the graph. Okay, so to do that, I go, and which is where I start my second part, um, we'll need SymPy's help. So I'll start off with some SymPy basics. Um, so, this is SymPy, and uh, a basic idea in SymPy is how you represent symbols, and symbols mean like x as in algebraic x, y as in algebraic y. Um, 
to make a, our Python program understand x as x and not a variable which needs to be have which needs to have a value, we have to create an object of symbol type. Um, so this is what we are defining. So this is the x symbol, and this is the again another object of the x symbol, although I am calling them differently. So when I do x plus y, it knows that both of them represent x, and it prints me to x. So that's the basic idea. Okay. Some more basics of SymPy. Um, so we have seen, we know what, what this does. We know what these two lines do. Um, next, we define an expression. So this is how I can define an algebraic expression in Python. I just say 2x plus 3x square. Um, and it's in a form, which, and let's say I have defined this uh, formula, right? And then I want to know what is the value of this expression when x is, say, 1. And to do that, I have to use the subs method, like substitution. And uh, it is used to provide basically the value of x that I want to substitute. So it essentially means that, okay, my book is not happy. Yeah. <laughs> so it essentially means that I want to substitute 1 in place of x in this expression. And once I run this, you'll see a value of 5. So that's how you substitute. That's how you find the value of an algebraic expression. Okay, that's then the another. Okay, this is a slightly longer program, and which basically builds up to our plotting program. So here, what I am doing is I am going to demonstrate how. So um, the input uh, function, which, which allows you to take, like, basically provide inputs to your program. Um, so. You, when you provide an input to a program, whether it's an integer, whether it's anything else, it goes as a string. So, which is basically when I say, when I input something like this, to Python it is a string, something like this. And whatever I give it. But in this form it is not understandable by SymPy. So, I cannot say SymPy to manipulate this in any way. So what I need to do is I need to use this function called Simpify, which basically converts this string to a form that is then understood by SymPy. And you can see an example here. What I have done is I'm, create, I'm creating this so-called simplified version of this input, and then I'm calling this function called factor, which basically factorizes this algebraic expression. And then I have the factors. OK, so that leads me to my, the create a graph program. So f that's your four lines. So in fact, I don't even need this four. This is not even needed. <laughs> so that's actually three lines. So I don't need this either, so but I'll leave it here. So. this first. Um, for those not familiar with notebook, this I, I need to do this so that the graphs are displayed in line. Um, when I run this, it asks me to enter an expression, which will be hopefully soon. Yeah. Just when you want them to work. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly right. Okay, so I'm going to do something else, let's say x sine x, and here you have a graph. So yeah, so that's a three lines. And it's not limited by what function it's going to be able to plot. You can give it pretty much, as long as it's of a single variable, it'll do it. OK, um, I'm definitely running short of time. So, And you can do things like solving equations. Um, once again, the number of lines is well, you can't, again, three lines. So that's all you need. So you, you just call this solve function, and it'll get the solution for you. OK, I'm going to 
go a bit express now. <laughs> um, so this is for inequality solving. Now this is a very long program, and the reason for that is it it can solve any kind of inequality, like whether it's a rational inequality, whether it's a polynomial inequality. So that's why I had to write this big program to just account for all the different inequalities you can have. Um, and once again, pretty similar interface. It asks you for the inequality, and then it will give you the the range, the solutions. That solves the inequality. Um, okay, so that's done. Okay, so how many lines would this take? Finding the limit of a function, like which is any guesses? Okay, I'll stop the suspense. <laughs> um, Once again, three lines. So all I do is, the symbol is not familiar. Limit is the class. Well, yeah, it's a class. Um, the class which is responsible for, I mean, not responsible for, like which is going to be useful for us when you want to find the limits of functions. So all I need to do is, I create an object, again, to represent that x is x. Um, I'll get that to get to that in a minute. But the more important point here is, um, so to here what I'm telling is I want to find the limit of the function sine x by x as x tends to 0. Um, so when I um, just create this and I run this cell, I get this expression which is very familiar for like all of us when we learn to do math essentially. Um, and this magic happens because of this init printing system. This is basically SymPy's own function, right? Deci like, so it basically detects that it's a notebook and so it renders it very nicely. Um, that's using MathJax again. Um, so as you can see here, it is not actually calculating the limit. It just shows that, okay, I'm going to calculate the limit. To actually calculate the limit, I have to call the do it method and then I have the result. Um, similarly, Um, for derivatives. Once again, pretty similar. Um, here, instead of the limit class, I import the derivative class. Again, I give a function, it prints it, like basically shows it, shows what it's going to calculate. And then again, I, um, I just call this do it func method and it gives me the derivative. Um, so the parameters to this class is the first is of the function itself, sine x by x. Second is the variable with respect to which you want to differentiate. Uh, if your function has multiple variables, it would then calculate the partial derivative with respect to that variable. And some, yeah, and next I have integration. Once again, very pretty similar to how we have been doing so far. We um, import the symbol, we import this integral class, we give the function, uh, we call the do it method, and out comes the integral. Um, so that was indefinite integral. This is how you do how we do definite integration. So the first is the function itself, and then we specify the variable and its limits. So this is a tuple. Um, so I'm specifying here essentially, basically this written in form of in in a form that Python understands. And again, do it function it creates this. Um, so as you can see here, it gave me a. <laughs> Sometimes friendly features become unfriendly, like so. Uh, it's it's vanished. Okay. Uh, okay. So so um, so this you will see that I have this evil f function after this. So basically, sometimes Simpy will give you the result in a form which is not in floating point. It basically uh, it, it's an abstraction which Simpy has, so it's not directly a floating point variable. What you can do is then you can call this evil f function, which gives you the floating point result that you may want to reuse in. Um, in around the calculation. Okay, so I've gone through this, gone through this, okay. Um, but can you do more? Like so far what you have seen is we can use Python to build um, basic calculators and really smart calculators. Um, we can certainly do more and uh, to do that what we'll do is we'll take it help of um, I think I'll skip this over for now. Um, I'll, we'll, we'll take help of interactive notebooks. And uh, by that, what I mean is something like this. So this is an example of um, drawing a fawn. Now, this combines um, non-uniform probability, which is um, well one of the things I was going to discuss, but I don't have the time to. 
This combines um, plotting graphs. This combines interactive widgets. So when I run this, I'm to hopefully I'll get a nice slider. Kernel starting. You would imagine everything would work. <laughs> okay. So when I run this program, I have this slider. And what this is essentially doing is this specifies the number of points in the phone that you want. Um, so I can change this, and it'll automatically draw the phone. Um, so the magic here happens with this single function, which is this interact function. The first argument to that is the function that will be called. And you can see that it, it takes a single argument, and which is basically the value of the slide that you're choosing. So very basic, but it really creates a very interactive um, experience. And you can play with the number of phones here, and similarly. Um, what else do I have? Um, yeah, so that's, I also have a demo of the Mandelbro set. I don't think I have the time for it anymore. I'll show the projectile motion quickly. That was one of my favorite things in physics when I was learning, so. Everybody's. Yeah, so. Um, I also found a way to have this. So, um, so this is one example of where I don't need notebook for showing this, but it's just obviously a more seamless presentation experience. Kernel starting. Anyway. So while the animation starts, what I'll do is um, so I want to talk about a bit. And what I want to talk about is, um, so we have seen a few examples of how we can integrate math and Python programming and even maybe science or other subjects. Um, it also gives us a good base for exploring other subjects like data science and machine learning. In fact, one of the demos that I have is something called of a gradient descent method. So the exact functions that I use for the derivatives, I actually used it to implement gradient descent. Um, and then, so after that I implement it to use a simple linear regression. And all I'm doing is I'm just using SimPy's own method. So I'm not having to calculate any derivatives numerically or provide the derivatives by hand. I'm calculating everything in the program itself. So I think all of that is a very good base for learning all these more even advanced things. OK, let's see. I, don't know. Okay. I have to show that. Let me see. has decided it's not going to work. So maybe I'll I'll try and run another demo. Wow, this is like a super fail to <laughs> No, it's not. It's not internet. It's it's local host. It's 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 all local host. It's, it's yeah. It's local host is failing. It's uh, ah okay. Well, the animation happened and we didn't see it. But anyway, so when I run this, <laughs> so yeah, I mean that's um, that. I I think what 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 this allows us to like 
basically experiment with projectile motion and understand what happens when you change the initial velocity or you change the angle. Here I have specified like the fixed initial velocity of um, 60 and an angle of theta and so basically allows us to explore various things without you know having to go to the field and th throw balls. Like um, so that's an okay I'm going to give give one last shot at making this work. Um, in the meantime, if you have any questions, please feel free and ask so that you know I don't waste time. <laughs> okay, round of applause, and then I'll grab some questions. <laughs> any questions? Or do we just want to see the next cool demo? Uh, actually, I don't know. I could show you gradient descent. <laughs> Yeah, we've got a question. Works. If we were to like show this to uh, students, um, would we be asking them to look through the code and see how it's written before they just play with the program? Uh, would that generally be it? And so, does your those little smart calculators have like things that you can ch cut and chop and and allow the students to maybe build their own sort of things? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. I guess that that's pretty much the idea. Like, so I guess explain the math a bit, and then basically show what it would look like in in, in those in a Python program, and then yeah, build upon it, and just that's that's pretty much the idea. Is the Jupyter notebooks? Sorry. Is the Jupyter notebooks like a requirement, or can no, other not IDs at all. Be used? No, not at all. Like, so the main reason I have used it is it's just easier to because it's seamless. I have the output there, so it's that it's not a requirement. <laughs> Um, except for the ones where I showed the sliders, those are Jupyter Notebook features. Yeah. I mean, one of the challenges that we've had when we show this kind of stuff to maths teachers is they come back with us, uh, come back to us with statements like, "Oh, but if students haven't done a hundred simple dif differentiation problems, they're not going to actually know what differentiation is," um, which I think is ludicrous because getting caught up with the computation aspect of it takes away from understanding the math. So. How would you propose, once a student's built something like this, teachers, I guess, investigating this in a more kind of genuine, real, applied way? Like, how is that going to change, or what implications is that going to have for what they actually do in this class, and how are they going to cope with that? Because um, I would argue that it meets the needs of the Australian curriculum better than the current practice does, but they may think otherwise. Um, so this is a proposal, obviously I don't have any experience. Um, so the way I, I guess it would work is first, okay, so this is, the, first they learn the math, right? I mean, obviously you would need to know what, what the derivative of sine x is, for example. Um, I think the next step would be to use that in some sort of a practical way, like for example, use it in a way where you would use that, um, you, you know what, all, so once you know already what the derivative of sine x is, there's no point in like you know, like in a program, you can just make a program do it once you once you know the math. So I guess, for example, of uh, uh, like the gradient descent method is a. I, it sounds very fancy. It's big. I didn't learn it in school. Abs absolute. That's all absolutely true. But I think that's a very good way to apply that in in a context where you don't need to worry about knowing the formulas anymore. You can. I mean, you know the formula. You just want a program to do it. But once you make a program do it, you know that your programming is class is going to be also useful for doing all these other things that you're learning, not necessarily limited to, you know, like solving, like, Fibonacci, like printing a Fibonacci series, for example. So, yeah, it, it's fuzzy, I know, like, it, it would be like you're sub trying to substitute, um, like, students, like, you know, like, pen and paper experience with programs, but, yeah, I think there's a, uh, somewhere in between where I think, like, it would just make the students more, ex like, I don't know, interested in both subjects that way. I'm a teacher, but I never used Jupyter before. So if I want to try this, um, where should I start? Or you have a book to recommend? Um, I don't know actually about books with Jupyter Notebook, but you could easily start. I mean, you could you could start simple, right? You could start with something like this. You could you could so ideally you would write this in a program. Let's say you would write a program. You would write um, it in a file. Yeah. Or the mechanics of actually getting and running. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so are you, okay, okay, so I'll get to that next. Um, so if, if you are to do it in a program, 
you just write these files in a file and then print or run them, either in your IDE or using the Python command line. So you could start with like this, right? Instead of doing this, you could write it here. And then you have that output. So I think this is the kind of, you could start it this way and then you could probably, um, there are other projects like NB Grader, which people use for classroom grading. So there are all sorts of things. Um, so I guess that would be one approach. The way you'd get it is, are you fam I think Anaconda node, are you familiar with the Anaconda Python distribution? Um, so, sorry? Yeah. So if you download that, you could you would get Jupyter Notebook straight out of the box. So all you need to do is run this command, like, not sure if you've seen. So here, for example, all I'm doing is, it's lost somewhere. Down. Jupyter Notebook. Down a bit, down a bit. Up a bit. Okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all I'm doing is running a single command. It starts, it's, it's a server program. So it starts and then your browser window opens and it shows you like all these files that you have. So yeah, I guess you could start that with simple. I mean, I'm not experienced Jupyter Notebook user either. Like I have just been using for my demos and everything. So, um, but, but there are resources, a lot of resources which basically would help you. I think there's a Jupyter for, Jupyter for teaching Google group where people can um, recommend things. Cool. Uh, one more question. Hi, it's sort of really a part answer to the, the question about trying out Jupyter and getting it installed. Um, one thing that's useful is a, there's a website called Wakari, W-A-K-A-R-I.io. It's basically a notebook server running in the cloud that you can just sign up for an account and you can just play with that play with it without having to install anything and figuring that out. So it's a good way of sort of kicking the tires before you learn a bit more about how to get things installed. Cool. All right, any last questions? Okay, thank you, Amit. Thank you. Um, so, so all the demos that didn't work here would all work if you try it locally. So yeah, give it a shot and try, you feel free to use it in any way you feel possible. There's no licensing restrictions or anything. So as long as you get something useful out of it, it'll be great. Thank you.